The topic of this morning's talk is Is the Quran God's Word? Many people have a misconception that Prophet Muhammad, may peace be upon him, was the founder of the religion of Islam. In fact, Islam is in existence since man first set foot on the earth. God Almighty has sent several revelations and messengers to this earth. All the previous prophets sent by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala were meant only for their people and their nation. And the complete message was meant for a particular time period. That's the reason. That's the miracle they performed. Like the parting of the sea. Like raising the dead to alive. Convinced the people of that time. But cannot be examined and verified by us today. Prophet Muhammad, may peace be upon him, was the last and final messenger of God Almighty. Sent to the whole of humanity. And his message is meant till eternity. The Quran mentions in Surah Al Ambiya, chapter number 21, verse number 110. وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ That we have sent not thee, but as a mercy to the whole humankind, as a mercy to all the world. Since Prophet Muhammad, may peace be upon him, was the last and final messenger, and his message was everlasting, that's the reason. The miracle given to him by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala should also be everlasting and examinable by us at all the times. Though Prophet Muhammad, may peace be upon him, performed several miracles which are mentioned in the hadith, that is the traditions, he never emphasized them. Though we Muslims believe in all these miracles, we only boast of the ultimate miracle given to him by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that is the Holy Quran Al Quran is the miracle of all times it proved itself to be a miracle 1400 years ago it can be reconfirmed today and forever in short it's the miracle of miracles probably <coughs> The only point common amongst the people, whether they be Muslims or non-Muslims, is <coughs> that the Quran was recited the first time by a man born in the city of Mecca in Arabia in the 6th century by the name Muhammad, may peace be upon him. Regarding the source of the Holy Quran. There can be basically three different assumptions. The first is that the Holy Quran, its author, is Prophet Muhammad, may peace be upon him, himself, consciously, subconsciously, or unconsciously. The second assumption that can be is that Prophet Muhammad, may peace be upon him, he obtained it from other human sources or from other religious scriptures. And the third is that the Holy Quran does not have a human author, but it is verbatim, the word or the revelation of God Almighty. Let us examine today all the three basic assumptions. The first being that Prophet Muhammad, may peace be upon him, was the author himself, consciously, subconsciously, or unconsciously. It is highly abnormal to challenge the testimony of a person who disclaims the responsibility of any great work 
whether it be literally, whether it be scientific or otherwise. But this is exactly what the Orientalists do who doubt the origin of the Quran when they say that Prophet Muhammad, may peace be upon him, was the author. The Prophet never ever claimed that he was the author of the Quran. In fact, he always said that it was a revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To think otherwise is illogical and would mean that he was telling a lie, God forbid. History tells us that never has the Prophet been ever reported of telling a lie till prophethood. That is till the age of 40. And all the people acclaimed him as a person who was honest, who was noble, who was chaste. No wonder they gave him the title Al Amin, the trustworthy. Friends and foes alike. Even those people who said that he was a liar, God forbid, after he claimed prophethood, even then they kept their valuables with him for safekeeping. Then why should an honest person lie and say that the Quran, according to the collection of Hadith by an nawi in Riyadh Salihin, Hadith number 482, it says that Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her, was the wife of beloved Prophet Muhammad, may peace be upon him, said that there were times when one or two months would pass without having fire being lit in the house because they did not have any cooked food. They survived on water and dates and sometimes supplemented by the goat milk given by the people of Medina. <clears throat> this was not just a temporary phase, it was a way of life for the Prophet. According to Riyadh Salihin, Hadith number 465 and 466, Hazrat Bilal, may Allah be pleased with him, he said that whenever the Prophet received gifts and provisions for the future, he gave it to the poor and the needy and never kept it back for himself. Then why should you doubt that the Prophet told a lie, Nawazbillah, for material gains? And there is a verse in the Quran which negates this theory. It is from Surah Al-Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 79, which says, then go to those who write the book with their own hands. Summa yakuluna hadha minindillah. And then say, this is from Allah. Liyashtarubihi samanan kalila. To traffic with it for a miserable pride. For the lullo mimma katabat aidihim. Then go to those for what the hands do write. For the lullo mimma yaksibun. Then go to those for what they earn. This was is talking about the people who wrote the book with their own hands and said it's from God Almighty or they changed the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There was every possibility that if Prophet Muhammad may peace be upon him himself would have written the Quran and attributed it to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in some point of his life he would have been exposed then he would be called as the biggest hypocrite and would be cursing himself in his own book. Some people say that Prophet Muhammad, the peace be upon him, attributed the Quran to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and called him, himself a prophet for status, for power, for glory, for leadership. What are the qualities of a person who wants power, status, leadership and glory? He wears fancy clothes, he eats very good food, he lives in mansions, in monumental buildings, he has guards, etc. 
our beloved prophet Muhammad may peace be upon him he made his own goat he mended his own clothes he repaired his own shoes he even many a times did the household work he was an amazing model of simplicity and humbleness he sat on the floor he went to shop in the market without any guards even when the poor people used to invite him he used to dine with them and eat graciously whatever was given to him so much so that that his detractors had mentioned the quran in surah tauba chapter number 9 verse number 61 said oh he listens to everybody what kind of a person is this he listens to every tom dick and harry once when a representative of the pagan arabs by the name of qutba he came to the prophet and said if you give us this claim of prophethood we will give you all the wealth in arabia we will make you the leader of arabia and crown you the king only thing that we want is that you should give up this message that there is only one god and the prophet refused by the revelation of the quran from surah fasilat chapter number 41 there were several attempts made once to his uncle abu talib that you give up your message and we will make you the wealthiest man in arabia the prophet said oh my uncle even if they put the sun in my right hand and the moon in my left i will not give up this mission until i die why should a person lead a life of such suffering and sacrifice when he was triumphant even with his adversaries and he was so humble and noble that at all the times of victory he always said it is due to the help of allah subhanahu wa taala and not my own genius some of the orientalist they come up with a new theory that the prophet he was suffering from mythomania god forbid mythomania is a mental disorder in which a person tells a lie and he believes in it so they said the prophet muhammad may peace be upon him told a lie nauz billah and he believed in it if a fight 23 years in stages part by part if this quran as they claim is from a mind which is subconscious or a crazy mind it could not have been so consistent and neither can a person be under the false impression that he is the prophet when everything is coming from his subconscious mind for a period of 23 years there are several facts in the quran which can disprove this for example quran mentions about several historical events which no one at the time of the prophet knew there are several prophecies which are mentioned which have been fulfilled there are several scientific facts which were unknown that time and has been confirmed today it is impossible for these sort of facts to come out from a subconscious mind or a crazy mind and the quran testifies in surah araf chapter number 7 verse number 184 do they not reflect that the companion is not one possessed with evil but he is a perpetual warner the quran repeats in surah al-qalam chapter number 68 verse number 2 thou is not by the grace of thy lord crazy or possessed it is said in surah taqwir chapter number 81 verse number 22 your companion is not possessed and mad 
So why should a person lie? It's not possible to discuss all the various theories put forward by them. If anyone has any new theory, they are most welcome to put it during question and answer time. And inshallah, I'll try my level best to clarify it. The second assumption is that the Prophet copied it from other religious scriptures or he got it from some human source. One historical fact is sufficient to prove this theory wrong. That is, our beloved Prophet Muhammad, may peace be upon him, he was an illiterate. And Quran testifies in Surah An-Kabut, chapter number 29, verse number 48, that thou was not able to recite any book before this book was revealed, nor was thou able to transcribe it before this. In that case, indeed, the talkers of vanities would have doubted. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knew that people would doubt the source of the Quran. That's the reason that in his divine wisdom, he chose his last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad, may peace be upon him, to be an ummi, an illiterate, an unlettered prophet. Otherwise, surely, the talkers of vanities, the babblers in the marketplace, would have something to say. And if the Prophet was literate, the critics, the cynics, would have had some weight to say that the Prophet copied it from somewhere else and rehashed it in a new form, knows Billah. But even this claim is denied. A point hardly big enough to hang a fly. And our Qari, Brother Ashraf Muhammadi, he recited the verse of the Quran from Surah Sajda, chapter number 32, verse number 1 to 3. Al Islam Meem Tanzilu Kitab al Arayb Fi Mir Rabb al Alameen. Al Islam Meem. This is the revelation of the book, without doubt, from the Lord of the Worlds. Do they say, He has forged it? Nay, it is the truth from thy Lord. So that thou may admonish a people to whom no warner was sent before, so that they may receive some guidance. The Quran is unlike any other religious scriptures which has a typical human type of narration, like a storybook. How does a storybook begin? It begins with, once upon a time, foxes and grapes, wolf and the lamb. Similarly, if you read other scriptures, it says, in the beginning was God, He made the heavens and the earth. In the beginning was the word, it may say, now it came to pass as though so it happened. In the Quran, does not have such human narrations in the beginning was so and so. And if you read the other religious scriptures, they have a typical sequence of the human narration. It talks about a particular person, it talks about his family, about the children, and the sequence runs in order. Chapter 1, chapter 2, it's in order. Quran 2 speaks about people and the family life, but it speaks not in a particular sequence like the human story book. The Quran has its own unique style. It's a unique book. The people who cannot prove that Quran is a work of a human being, and they finally come up and say that the Quran is a deception. Nausbillah. If you ask them, where is the deception? They will not be able to point out a single deception in the whole Quran. People, they believe in things for which they have got no proof or reason. And they fool themselves by sticking to it. For example, if I believe 
that this particular man he is my enemy for which I have got no proof for which I have got no reason but the moment that man comes in front of me because of my false belief I start behaving like his enemy he reacts and too behaves like my enemy and then I satisfy myself see I was right this man is my enemy because he is behaving like my enemy if it had not been for my initial false belief that man would have never behaved like my enemy so people believe in things without proof and reason and fool themselves by sticking to it Quran says that the revelation goes in parallel with reason some people say that holy scriptures they are beyond reasoning if they are beyond reasoning then how can we decipher which of the holy scriptures are true and which are false the quran in fact encourages reasoning it encourages a discussion many muslims feel that you should avoid religious discussions you should avoid getting into a dialogue where religion is concerned and they are sadly mistaken the quran says in surah nahl chapter number 16 verse number 125 ud'u ila sabili rabbika bil hikmah wal mauizat al hasna wajadilum billati ya ahsan that is invite all to the way of thy lord with wisdom and beautiful preaching and argue with them and reason with them in the ways that are best and most gracious quran encourages discussion encourages reasoning no wonder the arabic word qalu which means they say is mentioned 332 times and the arabic word qul which means say is also mentioned 332 times this proves that the quran encourages discussion there is a theory known as there is a theory known as exhausting the alternatives the quran says that this book this book the quran it is a revelation from god almighty if it is not then what is it you give the other alternatives some may say it's a handiwork of prophet muhammad may peace be upon him it has been disproved some may say he lied for material gains laus billah that has been disproved whatever claims you have got put forth and see whether they stand the test this is the quran it's a book it's paper and ink where did it come from it requires an explanation the quran says it's from allah it's from god almighty if it's not where did it come from in surah jashia chapter number 45 verse number 1 and 2 which says ha mim tanzil al kitab min allah aziz al hakim ha mim this is the revelation of the book from allah the exalted in power full of wisdom and quran mentions in several places that this is a revelation from god almighty it's mentioned in surah anam chapter number 6 verse number 19 in surah anam chapter number 6 verse number 92 in surah yusuf chapter number 12 verse number 1 and 2 in surah taha chapter number 20 verse number 100 it's mentioned in surah sajda chapter number 32 verse number 1 to 3 it's mentioned in surah yasin chapter number 36 verse number 1 to 3 in surah al-zumr chapter number 39 verse number 1 in surah ghafir chapter number 40 verse number 2 it's mentioned in surah jasha chapter number 45 verse number 2 it is mentioned in surah rahman chapter number 55 verse number 2 it's mentioned in surah waqiah chapter number 
verse number 77 and 80. It's mentioned several places. It's mentioned for Insan chapter number 76, verse number 23. In several places the Quran says, this is a revelation from... <laughs> the scientific community, they have a different approach. If anyone has a new theory, they say, we don't have time to listen. And they have a reason for that. They say that if you have a new theory, don't bring it to me unless you have a way, unless you have a test to prove your theory wrong. Unless you don't have a way or a test to prove your theory wrong, I don't have time to waste with you. It's called as the falsification test. That's the reason that Albert Einstein, in the beginning of the century, when he gave a new theory, that I feel that the universe works like that. Along with that theory, he gave three falsification tests, saying that if you think my theory is wrong, do these three things and my theory will be proved wrong. The scientists, they examined it for six years and then said, yes, the theory of Albert Einstein is correct. That does not mean that he's a great person. It means he deserves a listening. Quran has several such falsification tests. When you get into a discussion in future with anyone regarding religion, you have to ask him that do you have a way to prove your religion wrong? Believe me, I have not come across any person who has told me that I have a way to prove my religion wrong. The Quran has. The Quran has several falsification tests. Some of them were only meant for the past. Some of them are applicable for all times. Let me give you a few examples. The Prophet had an uncle by the name of Abu Lahab. He was the staunchest opponent of the Prophet. Whenever the Prophet spoke to any stranger, he used to follow the Prophet. The moment the Prophet departed, he used to go to the stranger and ask, What did the Prophet tell you? Did he say it is day? It's night. Did he say it's black? It's white. He spoke exactly of what the Prophet said. And there is a full chapter, Surah Lahab, chapter number 111 of the Quran, which was revealed. And it says that Abu Lahab and his wife, they will perish in hell. And it says indirectly that these people will never accept Islam. They will never become Muslims. This surah was revealed 10 years before the death of Abu Lahab. In that span of time, many of his friends who were also opponents of Islam embraced Islam. But Abu Lahab did not embrace Islam. Since he died, always against the Prophet, the only thing he had to do to prove the Quran wrong was to say, I am a Muslim. He did not have to behave like a Muslim. He did not have to act like a Muslim. He only had to say, I am a Muslim. And the Quran would have been proved wrong. It was so easy for him to prove the Quran wrong. Since he lied before, he just had to tell an additional lie. It is as though the Prophet is telling him, you think I am your enemy, come on, say this. Say I'm a Muslim and I'll be proved wrong. It was so easy, but he did not say it. This proves that no human being can make such a statement in his book. It has to be a divine revelation. Another such example is in Surah Al-Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 94 and 95, which says that they say that the last home of Allah is with them alone. It is meant for them alone and no one else. 
And the Quran continues. Tell them that if the last home for Allah is for them alone, tell them to seek for death. They will never seek for death because of the sins they have committed. This was re revealed during a discussion, during a confrontation between the Jews and the Muslims. And the Jews said that the last home of Allah, that is the paradise, is for the Jews alone and not for anyone else. So verse was revealed saying that if you think that paradise is specially meant only for the Jews, you call for death. Seek for death. And the Quran says, they will never seek for death. The only thing the Jews had to do at that time, any one of them, any one of those Jews, a single person would have come out and said, I seek for death. I want to die. Not that he had to die. Not that he had to act. Only thing he had to do was seek for death. Say, I want to die. And the Quran would have been proved wrong. It was so easy to prove the Quran wrong, but none of the Jews came forward and said that I seek for death. It's a falsification test. But now you may tell me that all these tests of the past, how can we prove the Quran wrong today if we want to prove it wrong? Quran has tests falsification tests, which are also meant for all time, for that time, and for today, and till eternity. The Quran mentions that many people claimed and said that the Quran is forged. So Quran tells them. It's mentioned in Surah Isra, chapter number 17, verse number 88, that say, if all the humankind and jinns were to gather together to produce the like of the Quran, they will not be able to do it even if they help each other. It's a challenge that if all the humankind and jinns gathered to produce the like of the Quran, they will not be able to do it even if they help each other. The Quran is acclaimed as the best Arabic literature on the face of the earth by Muslims and non-Muslims alike even if they help each other. The Quran is acclaimed as the best Arabic literature on the face of the earth by Muslims and non-Muslims alike. The Arabic language of the Quran, it is so clear, so meaningful, intelligible, unsurpassable, miraculous. It does not deviate away from truth, even though it rhymes unlike other poetry and literature. It is the highest order of rhetoric towards the revelation. The same verse of the Quran can convince even a common man as well as an intelligent person. It is a miraculous book. The same challenge that produced a research like the Quran is given in Surah Tur, chapter number 52, verse number 34. Later on, God Almighty, He made the test easy for the people. In Surah Hud, chapter number 11, verse number 13, which says, Do they say He has forged it? Tell them, produce ten such surahs forged, and let them call for help anyone besides Allah, if they speak the truth. And no one could produce ten surahs exactly like the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala further simplifies the test and says in Surah Yunus, chapter number 10, verse number 38, that do they say he has forged it? Say, produce one surah exactly forged like the Quran. One surah forged exactly like the Quran and call to help anyone besides Allah if you speak the truth. And they could not do it. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives an easiest of easy of the test. The easiest falsification test in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, 
verse number 23 and 24, which says, And if you are in doubt as what we have revealed to our servant from time to time, then produce a surah somewhat similar to it. And call forth your helpers and witnesses, if there are any besides Allah, in kuntum sadiqeen. If you speak the truth. Fa illam taf alu. But if you cannot. Walan taf alu. And of a surety you cannot. Fattakun nara lati vakudu hanna sabila jara. Then fear the fire. The fuel shall be men and stones. O idatil kafirin. Which is prepared for those who reject faith. First the Quran gave a challenge. Produce a recite like the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala simplified and said, produce ten surahs like the Quran. Then, produce one surah. Here it says, produce one surah somewhat similar. Mimmisli. The other places the Quran says, misli. Here it says, mimmisli. Somewhat similar to the Quran. And the non-Muslim Arabs, they failed miserably. Not that they didn't try. Arabic was at its peak when the Quran was revealed. Several, several pagan Arabs they tried, but they failed miserably. And some of their works is yet present in the historical books. And it makes them a laughing stock. The challenge was there 1400 years ago. It's even there today. Today, there are more than 14 million Coptic Christians. Christians who are Arab by birth. Arabic is the mother tongue. This test is even for them. Even if they want to try and prove the Quran wrong, only thing they have to do is produce one surah somewhat similar. And if you analyze certain surahs, certain chapters of the Quran, are hardly three verses, hardly containing a few words. But so far, no one has been able to do it, and no one will be able to do it in future, inshallah. You may tell me that Arabic is not my mother tongue. So, where do I fit in in this test? Quran has a test even for the non Arabs, for people who don't know Arabic. Everyone in the world. If they want, if they want to try and prove the Quran wrong, they can very well try the level best. I started my talk by quoting a verse from the Quran, from Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number, verse number 82, which says, Afala is the Barun al Quran, walau kana min indi gairillah, la wajadu fi ikhtilaf and kafira. That do not they consider the Quran with care. Had it been from anyone besides Allah, there would have been many contradictions. There would have been many discrepancies. The Quran is saying that if you want to prove the Quran wrong, just point out a single contradiction, a single discrepancy, a single fault in the Quran, and the Quran will be proved not to be the word of God. It's so easy. I do know that there are hundreds of people who have pointed out mistakes and contradictions in the Quran. Believe me, all of them, 100% are either out of context, the misquotations, mistranslations, to deceive the people. So far, no one has been able to take out a single contradiction or a single mistake in the Quran. Suppose, there is a Maulana who is very well versed in the history of Islam, but is not very well versed with the scientific knowledge. I do know of several Maulanas who are well versed in Islam as well as science, but suppose there is a Maulana who is only well versed with the historical facts of Islam, but is not well versed with science. And suppose you go to that Mawlana and tell him that here, there is a scientific mistake in the Quran. 
just because he cannot clarify that scientific mistake, the alleged scientific mistake in the Quran, that does not mean that Quran is not a word of God, because Quran says in Surah Furqan, chapter number 25, verse number 59, that ask the person who is well acquainted with those things, if you want to ask about the Quran, if the Quran speaks about science, ask a scientist. And he will clarify what does the Quran say. Similarly, suppose any one of the audience, they point out an Arabic grammatical mistake in the Quran. I am not an expert in Arabic, I am just a student. And if I cannot clarify that Arabic mistake, if I am able to, Alhamdulillah. But if I am not able to clarify that Arabic mistake, since I am not an expert, that does not mean that Quran is proved wrong. You have to go and ask a person who is an expert in the field of Arabic. So far, no one has been able to take out a fault in the Quran. And Inshallah, no one will ever be able to take out a fault in the Quran. After these logical explanations, no human being who believes in a God can say that Quran is not from God. Those people who do not believe in God Almighty, if they say it is different, but a person who does not who is not a Muslim, but if he believes in God, after producing these proofs, even he cannot say it is not from God. So the only third basic assumption remains is that it is a divine origin. The Quran has a divine origin, it's from God Almighty, it's from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Regarding the atheist, those who don't believe in God, all those atheists that are present here, I would like to congratulate them. My special congratulations to the atheists because they are using their intellect. They are using their reasoning power. Most of the people in the world who believe in a God, they are doing blind belief. He is a Christian, because father is a Christian. He is a Hindu, because father is a Hindu. Some Muslims are Muslims, because their father is a Muslim. They are doing blind belief. This atheist, even though he may belong to a religious background, to a religious family, he thinks that how is it possible that the people around me, they are worshipping a God which has got human qualities, quality same as me, how can I believe in such a God? So he says, there is no God. He rejects. Some Muslim ask me, Zakir, how come you are congratulating an atheist? I am congratulating an atheist because he has said the first part of the Shahada, the Islamic creed, La ilaha, there is no God. Now the only part remaining is Illa Allah, but Allah, which we shall do inshallah. He has agreed with the first part of the Shahada that there is no God. He does not believe in a God which has got human qualities. So it's our duty now to prove to him about the one and true God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The moment an atheist tells me, I do not believe in a God. I will ask him a question. What is the definition of God? What do you mean by God? And he has to answer. You know why? Suppose I tell you that this is a pen. If I say this is a pen, for you to say it is not a pen, you have to know the meaning of a pen. You should know the definition of a pen. You may not know what this is. But if I say this is a pen, and if you have to say this is not a pen, you should at least know the meaning of a pen. 
the definition of a pen. In the same way, if an atheist says there is no God, he should know what is the meaning of God. And the atheists they tell me that see, these people around me, what they worship, what gods they worship, it is their own creation. They have got human qualities. Therefore, I do not believe in these gods. I tell him that even I don't believe in such gods because the concept of God that these people have is a wrong concept. Since you reject the wrong concept, even I, the Muslim, reject these wrong concepts of God. La ilaha. But the moment I agree with him, I have to also tell him the true concept of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, Tala. Suppose there's a non Muslim who believes that Islam is a ruthless religion. It is a merciless religion. It is a religion connected with terrorism. It is a religion which does not give rights to the woman. It's a religion which conflicts with science. And if he rejects Islam, I will tell him, I too reject such a religion which is merciless, which is ruthless, which does not give rights to the woman, which is unscientific. At the same time, I have to correct the concept of Islam and tell him that Islam is a religion which is merciful. It has got nothing to do with terrorism. It gives equal rights to the woman. It does not conflict with science, it conciliates with science. Then, inshallah, the non-Muslims will accept the religion of Islam. It's our duty to correct the concept. In the same manner, I have to correct the concept of God Almighty, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the atheists. The best definition that I can give of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of God Almighty, from the Holy Quran, is Surah Ikhlas, chapter number 112, which says, Qul huallahu ahad, say he's Allah, one and only. Allahu samad, Allah, the absolute and eternal. Meaning, he's absolute, he's eternal. He has no beginning, he has no end. He is the one who does not require any help. He does not require things to eat. He does not require sleep. He is the one who helps other people but does not require help. Allah Samad. Allah the absolute and eternal. Lam Yalid Walam Yulad. He begets not, nor is begotten. He has got no father and mother. He has got no children, no begotten children. And there is nothing unto him like in this world. There is nothing comparable to him in this world. The moment you can compare Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to anyone, he is not Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is a four-line definition of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If anyone who you claim to be God Almighty, who you claim to be Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, fits in this four line definition. We Muslims, we have got no objection to accept him as God Almighty, to accept him as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What? Which are your candidates? Bring your candidates one by one. Some may say that Bhagwan Rajnish, oh show. Sure. He is God Almighty. Let's put him to test. The first criteria is Qul hu Allahu ahad. Say he is Allah one and only. Rajnish, we have several people like Rajnish. We have plenty of them in our country. But still, a follower of Rajnish will say, No, Rajnish is unique. He's only one. Okay, give him chance. Okay, let him pass the first test. No problem. The second test is Allahu Samad. Allah, the absolute and eternal. He does not require any help. He is the person who helps other people. 
Rajnish, we know very well. He was suffering from asthma, from diabetes. He could not cure his own disease. What will he cure your disease and my disease? When he went to America, he was imprisoned by the American government. Imagine God being imprisoned. He could not free himself. How will he free you and me when we are in trouble? And then he gives a statement that they gave me poison, slow poisoning. Imagine God can be poisoned. Put him to test. The Archbishop of Greece said that if you do not throw this God man Rajnish out, you will destroy his houses and the house of his disciple. And the president had to throw him out of Greece. Is he absolutely eternal? The third test. Lam yelid valam yulad. He begets not, nor is he begotten. I don't know how many children he had, but I do know that he had a father and a mother. He was born on the 11th of December 1931 in Jabalpur. And he died on the 19th of January 1990. But when you go to his center in Pune, there it is mentioned, Bhagwan Rajnish, never born, never died, but visited the earth from the 11th of December 1931 to the 19th of January 1990. They did not mention that he was not allowed to enter 21 countries of the world. He was not given the visa. He tried to enter. He could not enter 21 countries. Imagine, God is visiting the world. God is visiting the world. He can't visit 21 countries. Is this the God you believe in? And the last is, And there is nothing like it. There is nothing like him in this world. There is nothing. There is nothing comparable. The moment you can think what God is, you can draw his figure, he is not God. We know very well that Rajnish, he had long hair, he had a big flowing beard, which was white in color, he wore a robe. The moment you can think, you can draw a picture of God, he is not God. If you say that God Almighty, suppose, he is a thousand times as strong as Anil Swashnigar. Do you know Anil Swashnigar? He was crowned Mr. Universe, the strongest man in the world. If you say that God Almighty is a thousand times as strong as Anil Swashnigar or Dara Singh or maybe King Kong, he is not God. The moment you can compare him with anyone, whether a thousand times, whether a million times, whether ten million times, the moment you can compare him with anything, he is not God. Walam yaqullahu kufu an ahad. There is nothing unto him like in this world. I leave it up to the distinguished audience, the intellectual audience, to decide for themselves that whichever God they are worshipping, whichever God they are worshipping, let them put their God to test, to the four test of the Quran. If the God you are worshipping, if they pass the four tests, we Muslims, we have got no objection in accepting him as God Almighty. Otherwise, you can decide for yourself. After, after giving these proofs, some atheists, they may agree that now, we believe in such a God. But, most of the atheists will not agree. They will say, we don't just believe in such definition, we believe in something which is ultimate. We believe in science. I do agree. Today is the age of science and technology. So let's put the scientific knowledge that we have. Let us apply it to the Quran. These atheists, they say, this is a world of science and technology. 
we don't believe in such gods. Prove to us scientifically the existence of God, then we will believe in it. The first thing I would like to ask the question to these atheists or any educated man who does not believe in a God and who believes only in science, that can you tell me the first person who will be able to tell you the mechanism of an unknown object? There is an object, an unknown object, an unknown machine which no one in the world has ever seen before or heard of before. Now this machine is brought in front of that atheist or that educated man who believes in science that who will be the first person who will be able to tell you the mechanism of this unknown object. I have asked this question to hundreds of atheists. After a little bit of thinking, he replies, Maybe the creator, the person who has created that object. Some may say the inventor. Some may say the manufacturer. Some may say the producer. Whatever they will say, believe me, it will be somewhat similar. Either the creator, the maker, the manufacturer, the inventor. I have asked this question to hundreds of atheists. And all have given me somewhat similar answer. Whatever answer they give me, I accept it. I only keep it in my mind. It will be somewhat similar. The next person may be the person who the creator has told, or maybe someone does a research. But the first person will be the creator, the manufacturer, the inventor, or the producer. I ask that atheist who believes in science, how did this world come into existence? How did our universe come into existence? So he tells me that initially the full universe was one mass, the primary nebula. Then there was a big bang, the secondary separation, which gave rise to galaxies. And then for the stars and the planet in which we live, I ask him, where did you get all these fairy tales from? He said, no, these aren't fairy tales. These are established facts. We have got proof for this. I say, where did you learn? When did you learn all these fairy tales? He says, no, these are scientific facts. They aren't fairy tales. We learned it yesterday. Yesterday in science means 50 years back, maybe 100 years back, yesterday. And in 1973, a couple of scientists got the Nobel Prize for describing the Big Bang Theory. So I tell him, okay, you say it is a fact, I accept it. But what do you have to say about what is mentioned in this Quran 1400 years ago? It mentions in Surah al ambiya chapter number 21, verse number 30. Awalam yara lazina kafru. Do not be unbelievers. See, anna samawati wal arda kanat ratkan fafatakna huma that the heavens and the earth we join together and we clove them asunder. My Quran, which was revealed 400 years ago, there are enough historical proofs to show it was a book which was present 400 years ago. How come my Quran says it speaks about the Big Bang Theory? It speaks in a nutshell. You say it was discovered yesterday, 50 years back, 100 years back. Who could have mentioned this in the Quran? So the atheist tells me, maybe somebody guessed. I don't challenge him. I don't challenge him. I proceed. The world we live in, what is the shape? He tells me, previously people thought the world was flat. And people were afraid to venture too far, lest they would fall over. But now, we have enough scientific proof to show it is not flat, it is spherical. When did you learn? Yesterday, 100 years back, 200 years back in science. And if he has a good knowledge, he replies that the first person who proved that the world was spherical was Sir Francis Drake in 1597. I pose him a question. 
analyze what does the Quran say in Surah Luqman chapter number 31 verse number 29 it says that it is Allah who merges the night into day and merges the day into night merging means a slow and a gradual change the night slowly and gradually changes to day and the day slowly and gradually changes to night this phenomena is not possible if the world is flat it's only possible if the world is spherical a similar message is given in Surah Al-Zumur chapter number 39 verse number 5 that the night overlaps the day and the day overlaps the night the Arabic word you will discover as though you coil a turban round the head coiling this coiling this overlapping of the night over the day and the day over the night is only possible if the earth is spherical it's not possible if the earth is flat you tell me it was discovered recently can you account for who could have mentioned this in the Quran 1400 years ago maybe it's a good guess it's a wide guess it's a wild guess but it was a guess I don't challenge him I proceed the light that we have the light that we obtain from the moon where does it come from he will tell me that previously we thought that the light of the moon was its own light but today after science has advanced we have come to know that the light of the moon is not its own light but it's a reflected light of the sun I will ask you a question that it is mentioned in this Quran in Surah Al-Furqan chapter number 25 verse number 61 blessed is he who has created the constellation and placed therein a lamp and a moon which has reflected light the Arabic word for moon is Qamar and the light described there is Munir which is borrowed light or Nur which is a reflection of light the Quran mentions that the light of the moon is reflected light you say you discovered it today how come it's mentioned in the Quran 1400 years ago we will pause for a time you won't reply immediately and then may say maybe maybe it's a fluke I don't argue with him for sake just for the sake of the discussion I say okay you say it's a guess I don't argue with you let's proceed I ask him that when I was in school I passed my 10th standard in 1982 I had learned that the Sun was stationary the Sun revolved but it was stationary so he asked me does this what the Quran says I said no this is what I learned in school is it true he said no today science is advanced recently we came to know that the Sun besides revolving it also rotates it is not stationary it rotates about its axis and if you have an equipment you can have the image of the Sun on tabletop the Sun has got black spots and it takes about 25 days for these black spots to complete one rotation in short the Sun takes about 25 days to complete one rotation does the Quran say it is stationary he starts laughing haha ha. I said no my Quran says in Surah Al Anbiya chapter number 21 verse number 33 it is Allah who has created the night and the day the sun and the moon each one rotating about its own axis it revolves and rotates each one rotating about its own axis you tell me who could have mentioned this scientific fact in the Quran which was discovered recently is silent silent and after a long pause he replies let's see the Arabs were very well advanced in the field of astronomy so maybe some Arabs told your prophet and he mentioned this in his book I do agree 
I do agree that the Arabs were very well advanced in the field of astronomy. But I remind him that his dates are very poor. The Quran was revealed centuries before the Arab became advanced in the field of astronomy. So it is from the Quran which the Arabs learned about astronomy. It's not the vice versa. The Quran mentioned about several scientific facts. The Quran says regarding the field of geography, regarding water cycle. It says in Surah Zumur, chapter number 39, verse number 21, that seest not thou that it is Allah who sends down rain from the top, from the sky, and leads it into the sources of the earth and causes fields of various colors to grow. Quran speaks about the water cycle in great detail. It says in several other verses that the water from the ocean rises up, it forms into clouds. The clouds condense, there is lightning, and rain falls from the cloud. It's mentioned in several places in the Quran. It's mentioned in Surah Mu'minun, chapter number 23, verse number 18. It's mentioned in Surah Rum, chapter number 30, verse number 24. It's mentioned in Surah Nur, chapter number 24, verse number 43. It's mentioned in Surah Rum, chapter number 30, verse number 48. In several places the Quran describes in detail. This for a cycle which was discovered by Bernard Palissy in 1580. Only in the year 1580 was this present coherent water cycle discovered. Who could have mentioned the Quran 1400 years ago? In the field of geology, that atheist will tell you that there is a phenomena known as folding. The earth that we live, live on, the earth's crust is very thin. These mountain ranges, due to the phenomena of folding, prevent the earth from shaking. It gives stability to the earth. I tell him that the Quran mentions in Surah Nabah, chapter number 78, verse number 6 and, 6 and 7, that we have made the earth as an expanse, was Jibala Autada, and the mountains as sticks. The Quran says that the mountains are made as sticks, as pegs. And this is the description which the scientists give us today, that like the tent pegs. The mountains are like tent pegs. And Quran gives more information. In Surah Al Ambiya, chapter number 21, verse number 31, it says that we have set on the earth mountains standing firm lest it would shake. Quran says that they have made the mountain to prevent the shaking of the earth. That atheist will tell us that. Even though the salt water and the sweet water, though they meet, they do not mix. They remain separate. I, I will point out to him a verse from the Quran, from Surah Furqan, chapter number 25, verse number 53, which says, It is Allah who has created two bodies of free flowing water, one sweet and palpable and the other salt and bitter. And between them he has made a barrier which is forbidden to be trespassed. A similar message is given in Surah Rahman, chapter number 55, verse number 19 and 20, that he has made two bodies of water, between them is a barrier which is forbidden to be trespassed. Today science tells us that salt water and sweet water do not mix, there is a partition. He may tell me that maybe some Arab, maybe some Arab went underwater and he saw the partition and mentioned the Quran. They fail to realize that this is an unseen barrier. The Quran says Barzakh, an unseen barrier. And this phenomena is very much evident in Cape Town, 
that is the southernmost tip of Africa. Even in Egypt, when the Nile flows into the Mediterranean Sea. And the best example is the Gulf Stream, which runs for thousands of miles. Both the waters are present, but they do not mix. The Quran says in Surah Ambiya, chapter number 21, verse number 30, وَجَا أَلْنَا مِنَ الْمَاءِ قُلْ لَا شَيْنْ ہے We have created every living thing from water. Will they not then believe? أَفَلَا يُؤْمِنُونَ Will you not then believe? Quran says, we have created every living thing from water. Will you not then believe? Imagine, in the deserts of Arabia, where there is scarcity of water, who would have ever thought that every living creature is made of water? If they had to guess, they would have guessed everything but water. And today science tells us that cytoplasm, which is the main constituent of the cell, it contains 80% of water. And every living creature contains 50 to 90% water. Who could have mentioned this fact in the Quran 1400 years ago? And that atheist is mum. He does not give you a reply. There is a theory in mathematics known as the theory of probability. That suppose there are two options. And out of those two options, one is right and one is wrong. The chance is that if you make a wild guess, you will get the right answer. It will be one out of two. It will be 50%. For example, if I toss a coin, the chances that I will get the right answer is one out of two. It is 50%. If I toss a coin the second time, the chances I'll be correct the second time is 1 out of 2, it is 50%. But the chances that I'll be correct in both the tosses, first and second, will be 1 out of 2 into 1 out of 2, that is 1 fourth, or 50% or 50%, that is 25%. If I throw a dice, the dice has got 6 sides, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. The chance if I make a wild guess, I will be right, is 1 out of 6. The chances I will be correct all 3 times. The first toss, the second toss, and the third throw. The chances I will be correct all 3 times is 1 out of 2 into 1 out of 2 into 1 out of 6. Will be 1 upon 24. Let's apply this theory of probability to the Qur'an. Suppose, we agree for sake of argument, possible a person guessed. All the matter that's mentioned in the Qur'an, maybe somebody has guessed. Let us put this theory of probability to the Qur'an. The Qur'an says that the world is spherical. What different shapes can a person think of the earth? Some may say it is flat, some may say it is triangular, some may say it is quadrangular, some may say it is, it has five, it has five sides pentagonal, some may say hexagonal, some may say heptagonal, some may say octagonal, some may say spherical. Let's say, assume that you can think of about 30 different shapes for the earth. The chances that if anyone makes a wild guess, he will be right is 1 upon 30. The light of the moon, it can be its own light or it can be reflected light. The chances that if anyone makes a wild guess, he will be right is 1 upon 2. But the chances that both his guesses, the earth is spherical and the light of the moon is reflected, both are correct, is 1 upon 30 into 1 upon 2, that is 1 upon 60. In the deserts of Arabia, what can a person think that the human being can be made of? That the living creatures can be made of? What are the options? What different options can you think of that a living creature can be made of? A person in the desert may think it is made of sand, maybe it's made of wood, maybe it's made of aluminium, 
of iron, of copper, of oil, of water, of hydrogen, of oxygen. You can make at least 10,000 guesses. And the last that anyone will guess in the deserts of Arabia is water. But the Quran says that every living thing is made of water. In Surah al Amgya, chapter number 21, verse number 30. It says in Surah Nur, chapter number 24, verse number 45, that every animal is made of water. And in Surah Furqan, chapter number 25, verse number 54, every human being is made of water. If you make a wild guess, the chances that you'll be right is 1 upon 10,000. The chances that if anyone makes three guesses, and all three will be right, that the earth is spherical, that the light of the moon is reflected light, and every living thing is made of water, will be 1 upon 30, into 1 upon 2, into 1 upon 10,000. It is 1 upon 60,000. It works out to 0.0017 percentage. I leave it up to you, the audience, to decide for yourself that if you apply this theory of probability to the Quran, the Quran mentions hundreds of facts which were unknown at that time. If anyone made a guess, the chances that all the hundreds will be right, it will be somewhere very, very close to zero, and in the theory of probability, it will be zero. Some may pose the question, that Zakir, are you using scientific knowledge to prove the Quran? I would like to remind them that Quran is not a book of science, S-C-I-E-N-C-E, -E. it is a book of science, S-I-G-N-S. Quran has got 6,000 signs, ayats, more than 6,000, out of which more than 1,000 have scientific knowledge. I am not using science to prove the Quran right, because to prove anything right, you have to use a yardstick, something which is ultimate. For us Muslims, the ultimate is the Quran. Ultimate yardstick is the Quran. Quran is a Furqan, it is a criteria to judge right from wrong. But, for that atheist, for an educated man who does not believe in God, for him, science is the ultimate. It is his yardstick. So I'm using his yardstick to prove whatever Quran has said. And we know very well that many a times science takes U-turns. Therefore, I have only spoken about scientific facts which have got evidence and proof. I have not talked about theories which are based on assumptions. I am using his yardstick to say that whatever your yardstick has said recently, hundred years back, it has already been mentioned in the Quran. And finally, we come to a common agreement that the Quran is more superior than science. The Quran is the ultimate yardstick, not science. Quran mentions about several scientific facts. Quran says in Surah Taha, chapter number 20, verse number 53, that the plants have been created in pairs, which we discovered recently. It says in Surah Raj, chapter number 13, verse number 3, that the fruits are created in pairs. In the field of geology, it's mentioned in Surah Anam, chapter number 6, verse number 38, that the animals and birds live in communities which science has discovered recently. The Quran says in Surah Nahal, chapter number 16, verse number 68 and 69, it is the female bee which goes out and collects the honey. It is not the male bee which science has discovered recently. These be, they describe the pathway of the new garden they have found by the flapping of the wings. It's mentioned in the Quran, which we discovered recently. 
the Quran says in Surah Ankabut, chapter number 29, verse number 41, that the house of the spider is fragile. Besides describing the physical nature of the web of the spider, it is also describing about the relationship, the family relation, in which many a times the female spider kills the male spider. The Quran says in Surah Namal, chapter number 27, verse number 17 and 18, that ants are talking to one another. You may think it's a fairy tale book. What? Ants are talking to one another? Today science tells us the insect or the animal which has the closest resemblance to the lifestyle of the human being is the ant. It buries the dead. It has a very high system of communication. It has marketplaces, etc. Quran also speaks about medicine. It says in Surah Nahal, chapter number 16, verse number 16 and 69, that you get the honey from the belly of the bee, which we discover today. And in the honey, there is the healing for mankind. Today, science tells us that in the honey, there are antiseptic properties. No wonder the Russian soldiers used it to cover their wound, which left very little scar tissue. It is used in the treatment of certain allergies. Quran speaks about physiology. It says in Surah Nahal, chapter number 16, verse number 66, and Surah Mu'minun, chapter number 23, verse number 21, it describes the blood circulation and the production of milk. And 600 years after the Quran speaks about blood circulation, Ibn Nafif discovered it. And 1,000 years after the revelation of the Quran, did William Harvey made it famous to the Western world. The Quran says in Surah Tariq, chapter number 86, verse number 5 to 7, it says, Does not man think from what is created? Is created from a drop emitted from between his backbone and ribs. And today we know that the genital organs, the testes and the ovaries, during the embryonic age, they develop from where the kidney is placed between the backbone and the 11th and the 12th rib. The Quran says in Surah Najam, chapter number 53, verse number 45 and 46, and Surah Qiyama, chapter number 75, verse number 37 to 39, it says that it is the male which is responsible for the sex of the child, which we discovered recently. The Quran says that the embryo is covered that the fetus is covered in three waves of darkness, which is confirmed today. The Quran describes the embryonic stages in great detail. In Surah Mu'minun, chapter number 23, verses 12 to 14, and in Surah Hajj, chapter number 22, verse number 5, it says that the human beings have been created from a minute quantity of liquid, from something which clings a leech-like substance then made into a mudga, a chewed-like substance, then made into izaman, that is bone, then clothed with rahim, that is flesh. Quran describes the embryonic stages in great detail. The Quran also mentions Surah Sajda, chapter number 32, verse number 9, and Surah Insan, chapter number 76, verse number 2, that it is Allah who gives you the faculty of hearing and sight. And today medical knowledge tells us that hearing comes first. It is developed completely by the fifth month of pregnancy. And then the eye is split open by the seventh month of pregnancy. Quran gives the reply. In Surah Qiyamah, chapter number 75, verse number 3 to 4, that then the question is posed, how will Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala assemble the bones on the day of judgment? Allah replies, that we will not only be able to assemble your bones, we shall even assemble your very fingertips. 
Quran is saying, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can also assemble your fingertips. What does it mean? In 1880, Sir Gold, he described the method of fingerprinting, which today we use it to identify people. No two fingerprints, even in a million people, are identical. Quran speaks about fingerprinting method 1400 years ago. There are several examples of science. If you want to know more details about the scientific knowledge which is mentioned in the Quran, you can refer to my video cassette, Quran and Modern Science, Conflict or Conciliation, which is available for sale in the foyer. I would like to give one more scientific fact. That there was a scientist in Thailand by the name of Professor Takashan, who did a great deal of research in the field of pain receptors. Previously, science thought that only the brain was responsible. Only the brain was responsible for the pain. But recently, we have discovered that there are pain receptors present in the skin which is responsible. Quran mentions Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 54, that as to those who reject our signs, we will cast them into the hellfire. And as often as the skin is roasted, we shall change it with new skin so that they shall feel the pain. Indirectly, Quran is saying there is something in the skin which is responsible for the pain. It is giving an indication about the pain receptors. At first, Prophet Takashan could not believe. On verification, when you realize that this book is speaking about pain receptors 1400 years ago, he embraced Islam in a medical conference in Cairo and said, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, that there is no God but Allah. When you pose the question to the atheist, who could have mentioned all these scientific facts in the Quran? The only reply that he can give you is the same which he gave you earlier. Who is the person who can tell you the mechanism of an unknown object? It is the creator. It is the inventor. It is the maker. It is the producer. In the same way, the person who can mention all these facts in the Quran is the maker, is the producer, is the creator of the universe and its contents, which we call in English language as God and more appropriately in the Arabic language as Allah. Francis Bacon has rightly said that little knowledge of science makes you an atheist, but an in-depth study of science makes you a believer in God Almighty. No wonder today scientists are eliminating the models of God, but they are not eliminating God. They are eliminating models of God, La ilaha, but not God, illallah. I would like to end my talk by giving the translation of the second verses I quoted in the beginning of my talk from Surah Fusilat, chapter number 41, verse number 53, which says, Sanurihim ayatina filafahi, pafi anfusihim, hatta yatabayyana lahum anna ulhaq, awalam yaksi bi rabbika. Soon we shall show them our signs in the furthest regions of the horizons and into their souls until it is clear to them that this is the truth. Wa akhrud dawan alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Thank you. Jazakallah khair for the very rapt, uh, kind and rapt attention you all have shown during the course of the lecture. Now we come to the second part of our session and we hope to have a similar, in fact, a better interest of yours. That is the question and answer session.